this. <laughs> and it's amazing, like from everything, you know, when I think about the range of things that we've offered, our Poetry Pride Parade, our, our Juneteenth, um, we're, you know, we're, we're getting, we're, we're um, in progress of preparing for our next Juneteenth reading in June mm -hmm. and our Poetry Pride Parade. We just kind of came off of the, 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 the reading in solidarity with Ukraine and, oh, just all the different things we've done, as well as all the different new book showcases. Um, it's, been quite a, it's been quite a run for the past two years. I'm very, very grateful to all Speaking of which, I think you can begin this fabulous program. Oh. Don, yeah. we're ready to go? Yeah, yeah there, right. everything's going. Cool. Well, good afternoon, bienvenidos all here on this second Sunday of Poetry Month. Well, you're joining us here today for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And today, our format is our New Books Showcase. Sending you greetings as we celebrate not just the book, but poetry in general. And it seems very, very appropriate that as um, we've been here during this, this month of April, that we share poetry from all kinds of formats. So I want to begin today by thanking all the poets who shared work last week from the new anthology, I Want to Be Loved by You, Poems on Marilyn Monroe from Milk and Cake Press with our editors, Susanna H. Case and Margot Taft-Stever. And this week we welcome them back to celebrate their new books um, in addition to last week's anthology reading, what an incredible, incredible um, display of poetry from that anthology. And today, as I said, we're gonna be celebrating um, the new books of full length collections and chat books, those formats today with Susanna, Margot, and our two other readers, Andrea Deacon and Mervyn Taylor. So we have the opportunity to celebrate kind of the full range of how poetry is, is offered, to, um, to offered to the public. And I love that we're able to do that during this month of April. Speaking of which next week, and I'll mention this at the end of the program as well, we'll we will feature another of the beloved formats of how we share poetry, where we will have our open mic forum on the theme of emergence. Well, I'm your host, Sandy Unown, and again, it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, four poets today who will be sharing their, 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 their newest collections with all of us here assembled in Zoom, and also those of you watching live on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us today. I also want to remind you that Cultivating Voices Live Poetry began in March of 2020 to provide a weekly forum for poets to gather, to share published and emerging work. We have over 3,500 poets in our membership on Facebook worldwide, and we really seek to honor the intersectional, intergenerational, and international makeup of our membership on Facebook, where we continue to connect through poetry to connect with humanity through the beautiful, beautiful art of poetry. Well, let's turn to today's poets in our new books showcase. Each will be reading for approximately 15 minutes to give you uh, a beautiful taste of their latest collection. And I wanna encourage you to, of course, please support the poets and their presses by purchasing, if you have the resources today, uh, one, two, three, or four, all four, why not, of their, of their works. And you'll be seeing links to their collections in the chat 
as we go through the reading. Well, our very first reader today is Andrea Deacon. I am overjoyed to be able to have Andrea with us today featuring her debut chapbook, Mother Kingdom, which won the 2021 Slappering Hall Press chapbook contest and has only been out like a few weeks now. It's come out in March of 2022. So it's, it's a true joy to be able to not only celebrate Andrea's newest collect, Andrea's debut collection, but also the art of the chapbook. The art of the chapbook. The, the, the format is, 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 has been a staple in poetry communities for time immemorial. And so I love that we're beginning the reading today with the celebration of her chapbook, Mother Kingdom, and a little bit more about Andrea. So Andrea was born in rural Missouri. And as I mentioned, the debut chapbook is Mother Kingdom. Her writing also has appeared or is forthcoming in Beltway Poetry Quarterly, as well as Beyond Queer Words, The Blue Mountain Review, Spoon River Poetry Review, Valley Voices, and numerous other venues. Her awards include an honorable mention in the 2019 Spoon River Poetry Review's Editor's Prize Contest, and the second place in the 2020 Blue Mountain Review's LGBTQ Chapbook Contest. She is a former book editor and currently is working for the Multnomah County Library where she has been a staple there for 15 years. She is joining me right across the river here in Portland, Oregon, where she lives with her wife and daughter. It is such a great, oh, it's my great joy to be in the same city with you to be listening to your debut collection, Andrea. Thanks for, thanks for tipping off the reading for us today. Oh, thank you so much, Sandy, for that amazing introduction. And thank you for the whole community here for inviting me to read today. I'm gonna set a timer here real quick. Um, I'm so excited to be reading with these amazing poets, um, Mervyn and Margo and Susanna. I've gotten the, the pleasure to get to know them a little bit better the past nine months because they actually were my editors for the chapbook, Mother Kingdom. And that's what I'm gonna be reading from today. Um, it's been out for like, like Sandy said, for instance, um, March 20th. So I feel like in some ways it's my second child. I have one child who is eight years old, about to be nine. Um, but this was truly a labor of love. Um, and as you can see, it's just been beautifully printed. It's from Slappering Hall Press in the Hudson Valley, um, part of Hudson Valley Writers Center, which is a wonderful writing community. Um, actually their annual chat book contest is open now for all of you poets out there who have a chat book length manuscript ready to send out. Um, so I thought that I would read you some poems from this chat book today. Um, I was trying to think before this started how to describe Mother Kingdom, you know, in, in graduate school, I, I used to study book publishing and writing at Ooligan Press at Portland State, and they talked about like, what is your elevator pitch for your book? And for me, um, Mother Kingdom, you know, it is about traditional motherhood, I guess, but it's also about how do we subvert the toxic systems that we are born into if that if that type of mothering doesn't work for you. And I think especially as a queer person, that is something I think about all the time because my daughter has two mothers and we have had to sort of make our own family without any sort of larger cultural examples. Um, and then it's also about what is happening to our larger mother, the earth, which I think is also a system of these fractured, toxic, um, patriarchal systems that are handed down to us that I think every day we can make a choice whether or not we want to like live those truths or not in our daily lives and also in relationship with the larger communities of the world. Um, anyway, so I'm going to start with my first poem. It's called Evolution. And um, some of 
the poems. So a lot of these are kind of take place in Missouri um, in my childhood home, which was basically the river. I grew up on a river, the Osage River. And in a lot of ways, the, the place of the chat book is it's kind of its own character. So I thought I would start with this poem called Evolution. And in it, um, it begins with my father. He had a habit of um, looking for arrowheads every fall and spring after these, this one field was plowed. And um, that is where the poem begins. Let's see if I can find it, Evolution. Was it when I followed my father to the fields, his back hunched, searching for arrowheads, my feet sinking in the newly turned earth? Or was it seeing my mother from the doorway, her back a waning crescent in the dark? Words came easily to me then, alone with paper, my mind a sweet shadow, time a blanket around my shoulders. But coming out my mouth, they choked and stumbled my face the crushed color of cherries stuck to the bottom of a boot. When I told my father I was gay, he was chopping radishes, their red skins half moons on the cutting board, little gleams of white like a promise worth keeping. His careful hands slicing, their rough wintered edges that held so many things, dogs, babies, stones the color of starlight, my wild heart, beating the knife's calm rhythm. What can I fix you to eat? My mother was not so easy. Her face pinched pale in the thick dark of her bedroom, thin covers a moat of righteous limbs, and I the only sinner. Even now, all these years later, my heart closes when I hear her voice. Today it's cold, but the crocuses are coming up ochre pollen petals small as thimbles. Soon the geese will head back north, their black wings cutting through soundless cloud. Okay, thank you. Um, so my next poem is called First Kill. So I grew up an only child um, until I was 13. We lived in the woods, my mother and father and I. And then my father remarried when I was 14. And my new mom, stepmom, had six children, three boys and three girls. And they were ages 17 to two. And I was 14, so I was kind of like in the upper tier of children. Um, but one of my new brothers was also 14. And not only that, he was born the same month that I was. And not only that, he was born the same week that I was. We actually are only four days apart. So in this poem um, called First Kill, we are approaching a deer stand together in the woods. On the inside, the deer stand was surprisingly small, white bucket in the corner, wet sawdust and piss. The thrill of being alone with him, this new brother I had gotten just weeks before by way of a second marriage, four days apart, the two of us born the same month and year. My father had taken us hunting. Anything could happen. I don't know who saw it first, but soon it was in our hands as we stood side by side, holding the magazine, curling at the edges, all those women and our eyes on them like magnets. When my father returned with a doe, calling and calling our names, we scampered down the steps, guilty children, our minds already on dinner. Years would pass before I knew the soft rumblings in my body could begin to speak its impossible language. But in the deer stand, the crickets were loud in my ears. The humid air stuck to my skin as I carefully turned the pages. My new brother, just inches from my molting body, its pimple cheeks and long coltish legs, our heads bowed as if in prayer. That night, we dined like kings. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to kind of switch gears for a second. So like many of you, I've been thinking a lot about the war in Ukraine and um, just kind of 
on, on a larger level, like what, what is there that creates war? What are the emotions behind war? And I wrote a poem called Morning Prayer back when Donald Trump was still president. And um, it was before the pandemic. And it was sort of like, I think the middle of his presidency. And in the, in the poem, um, I reference him dropping bombs. And what's so interesting, I think, about this time of life is I didn't remember what bombs I was talking about. Because I feel like so much has happened since then. And also, we are so desensitized to violence in our larger culture and um, our collective memory of it is so short that I think I actually had to look up what bombs I was talking about. And so it's possible that I was talking about bombs that he dropped in Yemen because I looked this up on Google. I Googled, which bombs did Donald Trump drop when he was president? Um, I found a quote that said he ordered more attacks on Yemen than all previously previous US presidents combined. Um, but it's also possible I was talking about dropping bombs in Iraq, dropping bombs in Syria or Afghanistan. Um, and so I think too, with the chat book, I'm really interested in, in how larger systems become so fractured that where war is just a constant and where, where that comes from. And I think it, it, it is an uh, original mother wound, maybe, maybe the original wound of war is the mother wound. Anyway, <laughs> so this, this poem is called Morning Prayer. And it's, it's kind of written just sort of as one long um, string without hardly any punctuation. I left my keys in the door all night forgotten while fires raged across the globe and our president bombed other countries to distract from his own shame what kind of place is this to give you? Who didn't ask to be born? The same way I folded inside my own skin as a girl taught not to take up space. And what did my mother feel as a girl when she heard her door opening in the night? Was that the moment her heart closed for good when she built a fortress around her small body brick by brick when heaven became the only salvation. And did I see the girl in her when she tried to pray my gay away, the tight closed eyes and fists, my heart shrinking, swelling, flying away. All the things we do in the name of love, all the ways we keep trying to get free. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I've got one more. Let's see. It's called We Carry Stones with Seasons Inside Them. Um, and it's about my daughter. So at the time she was six years old and now she's almost nine, um, even though at times I think she's 13 um, <laughs> with the way she <laughs> talks to me. Um, so, but in this poem, we had just read this book um, where these children had gone on a hike and they had collected all of these rocks and they put them in their backpack. But then by the time that they went to go back to their car, um, the, the backpack was too heavy to walk. And so they basically made these towers of rocks um, to leave for so, someone else to find as sort of like a, an homage to their hike. And so we, re we read this book and then my daughter was just obsessed with trying to find rocks that were flat enough to make towers. And she loves rocks. I think it's you know part of the family. I love rocks. My father loves rocks. My wife loves rocks. But on this particular day, she was really upset because the rocks that we found at the beach near our house on the, on the Columbia River, um, they did not, they were not up to par. So this poem is called, We Carry Stones with Seasons Inside Them. And it's my last poem. Thank you so much. Newly six, my daughter fills her fists with rocks to stack from the bruised edge of the Columbia just north of our house in the city. She squints and stomps like a displeased general. Everything has gone wrong. The wind and water stretch around us, a large lumbering animal rubbing its eyes. It will be fall in a few weeks. Mama, they are too small, she says, not flat enough for the fierce towers in her mind. Her legs blur as she charges ahead. 
Soon she is on to the next item of business, but I'm left searching. How much she starts that I take on as my own. What motherhood is, the push and pull of waves at the shore. I pocket those that call to me, mostly smooth ones giving me a kind of peace, probably the closest thing to prayer I've ever felt, river rock to skin. We walk to the top of the boat ramp, jagged concrete ridges reminding me of the time when I was seven or eight and played hide and seek with the summer people a half mile from our house on the Osage. I don't remember if I was it when I fell, slicing my knee on those steep steps, blood caught in the grooves. I looked for a boat full of people, coolers and catfish, tackle hanging off the sides. Instead, there was only murky water, bloated bugs and old beer cans, my blood. Someone's cousin carried me all the way, running toward our cabin at the end of the tree-lined gravel, windows dark, the dogs barking, it's bad, you're gonna need stitches. My sweaty hands held his neck. Already shrinking into myself, I shrugged it off, a summer blossom closing at dusk. At the hospital, they gave me six stitches. The boy had been right. It was my body and I was the last to know. Thank you so much, thank you. You're muted, Sandy, you're muted. Thank you so much, Andrea Deacon. I don't know why the last two weeks I have not been unmuting myself, like it's so strange. Anyway, you'd think I'd know how to do this by now, but even I, even I have the, uh, the difficulty with the mute button. The new collection, the chapbook, oh, the beautiful art of the chapbook is Mother Kingdom from Slappering Hall Press. It won the 2021 Slappering Hall Press chapbook contest. And uh, what I really appreciate about what you shared today, Andrea, is the, the, the prismatic way that, that we think about motherhood in all of its facets. So I really marvel at uh, these poems that, and not only of the corporeal motherhood, but what it means to connect with Mother Earth as well. Wonderful work, congratulations, and come on back and read with us again soon, please. And here's to, Here's to Portland, <laughs> where we both are today. I don't usually turn around my, my turn around my camera like that, but I want you to all see downtown Portland. Well, everyone, I'm so glad to be able for two weeks in a two weeks in a row to have Margot Taft Stever with us um, and to share and celebrate her latest collection. Last week it was as editor, this week it's to celebrate her newest collection, which I will tell you a bit about in a moment. Well, today we'll be hearing from the latest of three full length poetry collections that have come out recently. Let me mention a few of the other titles. Cracked Piano from Kaven Carey Press in 2019, and that was shortlisted and received honorable mention for the 2021 Eric Hoffer Award Grand Prize. The book that we will be hearing from today is The End of Horses, which was only just recently released from Broadstone books. Margot also has chapbooks galore, including Ghost Moose from Cattywampus Press, 
and her poems have appeared in just everywhere in literary magazines, including Verse, Daily, Planet Human Quarterly, Cincinnati Review, Radapalix, Upstreet, Salamander, West Branch, Poet Lore, Poem A Day, and poets.org and the American Academy, the Academy of American Poets, as well as Prairie Schooner. She's currently an adjunct assistant professor in the bioethics department of the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University and teaches a poetry workshop at Children's Village, a residential school for at-risk children and adolescents. She is the founder of the Hudson Valley Writers Center and founding and current co-editor of that miraculous marvel of poetry, Slappering Hall Press. I wanna also mention that proceeds from the sale of the end of horses, all the proceeds for, these, for the book will go to support the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, which the organization's mission is to protect and conserve the world's oceans and marine wildlife. It is my great pleasure to welcome today, back to the program, <laughs> Margot Taft Stever. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for being with us two weeks in a row. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for having us two weeks in a row. That's, thank you so much. And thank you also for this, your wonderful poetry and for this great reading series. Thanks the same to Don Krieger for all the work he does for this series and many other endeavors and his wonderful poetry as well. And Andrea, thank you for that great reading. This was just a slice of our chapbook and each poem is equally as amazing as the ones you heard today. And if you do know anyone who has not published a book or chapbook, please encourage them to look at the guidelines at the Hudson Valley Writers Center website. We're the small press imprint of the Hudson Valley Writers Center. And the main mission of the press is to provide opportunities for emerging poets. We're a mini, mini micro press, but we publish some amazing poets like Susanna H. Case, who's one of our co-editors for Slappering Hall Press. And it's really wonderful also to read with Mervyn. The graphic horrors of war are ongoing against the continuing climate disaster. Gandhi said that you can judge a society by the way they treat animals for a reason. We are in a position to save the oceans and, and save at least some of the iconic animal species, such as the lion, tiger, elephant, snow leopard, monarch, and so on from extinction. But we have to all act together and act now. Treehouse, something about roots, bone-like, tenacious, that grip the moving ground. The branches like umbrellas bent back and broken by the storm. The leaves veined references to hands and the sound of the winds wild working against the leaves. The boy collected the branches and stored them under his bed. Something about the tree seeped into his dreams the trunk a hallway, the branches outlined rooms, and his family finding shelter in the boughs, listening to the sound language of leaves. He did not see a garden, apples, or any fires. Everyone huddled together to keep warm. Once we had a friend who would hunt with his hawk. M Molly is a word of Irish origin, which means bitter. And it also names the kind of fish popular in aquariums bred in many colors. Molly sky. The molly sky, the lemons in the tree. The molly sky, the lemon, the lemon squeeze. So much more has happened since you left the apple tree. The worms have ridden with the red. The sky is bare and blank. What is it about birds, their bodies rounder than ours, and their wings so certain of flight, so clear of the tangled wind? The hawks with bells on their tails gird the highest trees, still to spot their prey, the treed squirrels, the bunnies startled from the thicket, 
Everything that moves is game. Bird feathers are straighter than an arrow, straighter than a tree. The ocean is the sky and you are me. Leaves hang like fish, loaves on the tree, autumn brown ground out. Hang like little faces, hang like faces, past faces hanging from the tree. I'm going to read next a poem in honor of the 1,100 mutilated dolphins that washed up on the shore of France a couple of years ago. And they were mutilated by their attempts to get to the surface to breathe. Trawlers now work in pairs and drag a net between them. And as a result, the European dolphin is on its way to extinction. Ballad of the Dolphin. Ancient Greeks said they should be treated as humans. Their sailors would not kill dolphins. How I have thought of you caught in the fishermen's nets. They would set them to trap you to catch the tuna that swam under your schools. How the fishermen hung you still alive upside down. Your cries brought others. Fishermen grabbed you by your tail, strung you and turned you head down in water, tied you to lifting hooks and dragged you to the docks. If any of you were still alive when they slung you on cement, they stabbed you. How last survivors churned the water red, leaping in panic, waiting to die. In a good catch, it took them three days to kill all of you. How mothers whose calves were entangled could not lift them to the surface. They listened to their helpless underwater clicks and sighs. How often I remember the whale skippers who would radio the location of hundreds of you, allowing tuna fishermen to track down your entire pod. Their nets deep, foaming, wide, so that hundreds could fit inside. How they used underwater sound to confuse and drive you down. How many of you drowned? Fishermen did not want to compete with you, but killing you was not enough. How they used the screams of several to slaughter more. How one of you hangs from the prow, still alive, calling, calling. I'm going to read um, next a poem that I haven't read for a long time. Litany of the Sow. Industry-wide, about 10 million piglets are crushed by their mothers each year, according to pig production experts, and studies have pointed to bigger litters as a major contributor. Michael Moss, New York Times. Farmers drug her to birth more piglets in a cage so small they cannot move. Her piglets cry out in pain, bones dig in her skin. There was an old woman who lives in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. It doesn't matter, nothing she can do. 14 piglets suckle at her teats. Her shi her, she shifts her body to keep from losing limbs. Hear her moans, her babies tear skin. Nothing she can do. Under her weight, her great broken heart, sighs of last breaths, the shudders, bones of her own, she can barely move, bones slash into her skin. They bind her in steel, she cries out. 14 piglets suckle at her teats. She cannot move to comfort them. This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home. This little piggy, bones broken, bones dig in, her great broken heart. And I, I borrowed her great broken heart from Galway Cannell's poem, St. Francis and the Sow, which is also just, it's a beautiful poem. Farewell. Goodbye, my orchid, how I have loved you. The subtle dream of your varying blue colors, the verdant arc of your stem, how you are happy only in certain places, how much else we have in common no one knows. Goodbye, my backyard full of palm trees swishing, bristling, full of tiny lizards who climb up the screen porch 
to bathe in South Florida sun. Goodbye our two lounge chairs by the pool where I never sat, but always thought lovingly of you, of bathing in the sun. Goodbye all the mighty bird sounds, the egrets, the great blue herons, the anhinga who spread her wings to dry. Goodbye to the sullen creature I glimpsed by the pool's edge. Whether you were a Nile monitor lizard or Argentine tegu, I will never know. When I rushed out after the dog's bark scared you away, I found another lizard you had chased into the pool and I rescued him. As if he didn't know whether he lived or died, he crouched, stunned and mute in the grass, but he too has run away. Goodbye, my hibiscus. I have forsaken you because you couldn't survive the trip back up north. Goodbye, intermittent showers that pour from one cloud like a teapot while neighboring skies remain blue and sunny. How I have loved you all. And I'd like to read just a couple more short, po short poems. I have a cat who's very hungry and is running around the room trying to get my attention. <laughs> but anyway, this is the title poem, End of Horses. I write to you from the end of the time zone. You must realize that nothing survived after the horses were slaughtered. We, we sleep below the hollow burned out stars. We look into dust bowls searching for horses. When you walk in the country, you will be shocked to meet substantial masses on the road. We do not know whom to blame or where the horses were driven, who slaughtered them or for what purpose. Had the horses slept under the linden trees, the generals and engineers pucker and snore on the veranda. And this is, this is the last poem in the, in the book and the last poem that I'll read, Ocean Birds. Jealous is the night, the feckless night, coming over us as water into sea, the forceful day's geography turned black. Your body is the sea I float upon, your skin becomes the waves. Nothing will ever bring you here to me. Nothing will ever call you back. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Margot. Everyone, you've just heard poems of Margot Taft Stever. The collection is The End of Horses. And I wanna just remind you all that this latest of her collection from Broadstone Books, the proceeds are devoted to the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, which is devoted to the protection and conservation of the world's oceans and marine wildlife. And of course you heard that most um, moving of poems about the dolphins. And um, again, I, I, I love the connection between your work and Andrea's work in, in the, the notion of how important it is to shepherd and support our, not just our mother tongues, but our mother earth. And the work is such a testament to that. Thank you so much for bringing the book to us today and for all the poetry that, that you bring to people every single day through all the work that you do at the Hudson Valley Writers Center, as well as at Slappering Hall Press. Thank you, Sandy, thank well, you. Of course. Well, our next reader, is the illustrious Mervyn Taylor, who has read with us before here on Cultivating Voices. And I am just absolutely, um, again, overjoyed that uh, this particular constellation of poets could join us today. 
and um, I'm so, I'm so I'm so glad that Mervyn is able to share his latest work with us on the program with all of you. Let me share a little bit about Mervyn's background with you. Uh, he has had a most remarkable career, a multifaceted career. Well, Mervyn is originally from Trinidad and has been a Brooklyn resident for many years and has lived between the two countries. It's an, it's an interesting, introspective way that you become to understand um, what it is, what it has been like to inhabit multiple residencies as a poet. Um, we, and we get to hear that multifaceted experience in Mervyn's work. Mervyn's taught at the Bronx Community College, the New School, as well as in the New York City public school system. And now that he's retired from teaching, he's devoted much of his time to the craft and art of writing poetry, where he's been able to author seven full length collections, including No Back Door, Voices Carry, and the more, most, most recent Country of Warm Snow, all of these were from Shearman's books. The Country of Warm Snow was a poetry book society recommendation and long listed for the 2021 OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean literature in the poetry category. And a, a latest chapbook is News of the Living Corona Poems, published by Broadstone Books. You know, we're so, we're so fortunate today to not only be able to celebrate the work of these four poets, but also to honor the work that, that all four of them do to support so many other poets through Slappering Hall Press, uh, as, as we heard from Andrea's work today. And Mervyn is one of those illustrious co-editors at Slappering Hall Press. It's such a great, honor for me to be able to welcome you back, Mervyn, and thank you for sharing your poetry with us today. Thank you, Sandy, for that great introduction. Um, guys, getting on has been a bit of a job today, and um, so I'm talking to you using my phone. So if, it, if there's a lot of jiggling and funny stuff, please forgive me. It's a weird connection. So I'll get right into it. I'm, I'm going to read uh, some poems from Country of Warm Snow because it's still new, um, not having had a chance to launch it properly and all those things, right? Men only. The waiting room at the prostate doctors is full of depressed looking men drinking extra cups of water so they can pee as the nurse stands behind them with the contraption that measures the girth of your penis when you're done. The mind wills the body to cooperate, the stream to be strong. Later, before the intrusive camera, your gland withdraws as the technician tries to distract you with stories of her boyfriend who doesn't like her doing this. Breathe, she says. Outside, I recognize more than one guy from my neighborhood. We nod disconsolately when the doctor, a sharp dresser, tells the nurse to set, schedule someone else for surgery. We toast each other with more water. The artist as immigrant. I keep hearing their prayers as they lean against subway doors. And I recall the tremble in my friend's voice on the line from Ohio, hiding in his dorm after reading about summer rest far from where he was studying. The girl who said she would marry him, changing her mind at the last hour. And when I let him stay at my place that summer, he wanted no radio, no TV, fearing news of anyone being rounded up. 
He painted a mural on my wall and lived in it, while on the basketball court outside were guys from all over yelling profanities in strange accents. Now he's safely married, living somewhere in Delaware, but his wife admits there are nights he still wakes in terror, scaring his grandson coming down the hall. Don't mind the jiggling, I'm just moving stuff up. <laughs> okay, page 50. Woman in the ringside seat. She came to all of Ali's fights, hoping one night to see him finally get knocked out. She tasted his sweat flying everywhere, heard his interview with the showman announcer, the anti-American oath he swore, his declaration of objection, his name change. Honestly, she'd preferred Cassius, the artful dodge of clay, the malleable nature of it, the speed of his boots as he used the rope. But the conviction in those gloves in the Muslim name, victory after victory made her gasp pay to see him get defeated. And those awful heroic couplets he composed, she cursed the night he added her to one of his verses, butterfly, bee, the demise of all species, the pretty and the not so. The viewing. In the middle of the eulogy, a gas bubble erupts near my heart, the nerve in my elbow sending its funny message to my brain. Up on the screen, there's Scrapper, the deceased, under a thick mustache grinning broadly, as was always his way, even when he needed two canes and couldn't stand for long. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer I find myself singing. So loudly, a lady in the front turns around, the feather on her black hat trembling. This is News of the Living, uh, the Corona Poems, um, a book written in speed in Trinidad while I was there on lockdown. Although I hate to use the word lockdown, I, it was a wonderful sojourn for about a year and a half but news of the living. So I'll read you a couple of poems from this one. First one is called Distancing. I'm doing a one-handed thing here, people, so kind of bit, just bear with me. Distancing. I'll return when I can hug you, when the jealous beast has gone its way, when the old sugar mill has rusted into sad beauty and milk from the dairy is again safe to drink. When the sun has burned traces of bodies into the ground, lonely patches of grass between them, I will cross the street, a man with a piece of paper looking for an address, assuring people she lived around here somewhere, meaning you, love whom I kept my distance from, sailing from island to island, searching among all those naked girls in the carnival. And this is dreaming in pandemic. In my dream, it is still last December. I haven't left for the island yet. I am promising a shell you can put your air to and hear whatever sea I am swimming in. All those other images have yet to happen. The dead in trenches on Hart Island, corpses in U-Halls on Utica Avenue in Kings County, a hand tearing the tube out of a chest, a body lost among the rest. It is not yet spring. There are snows to come in drifts, the homeless in shelters, and there are planes idling on the runway waiting to take off for beautiful places, the bat not yet having flown across 
our range of vision and you sending me one last kiss. So that's from News of the Living. So I, I'll read you just a few poems from what I hope, well, not what I hope, a new collection tentatively titled A Common Place from Broadstone, due out next spring. War days. Days of rations and shortages with the yellow ration card of lines outside Al Young's shop and on the door the phrase Kilroy was here. There were rumors of subs in the sea all around of enemies embedded with us on this island far from any bombing. It was not our war. Still my aunt sang, buy a Flanders puppy, save it for a souvenir. And when they ask who you're buying it for, say Trinidadian boys who died in the war. And we remained as quiet as a blackout in Britain, no carnival for years, only the red effusion crackling with news and sailors in town searching for the harbor, while my father, responsible for keeping the trains moving on the way to work, kissed my mother as I insisted on the lips, dad, on the lips. The boy who lived down the lane. When Otis died, I heard they lit candles from the north to the south, try a little tenderness in the island air. And when Carla arrived years after, Anne-Marie took her to see where I grew up, the boys breaking down the fence, so much they wanted to know about how we met. I heard my uncle entertain the ladies with tea, my heart stuck in DC, in the cafe where she said I resembled Chuck Jackson when a boy named Tom was a big hit. Ah, Carla, you made me famous for a minute. The boy who lived down the lane and the girl with Otis who sang Tramp. I'm sorry, the younger people may not know. This is Carla Thomas who sang with Otis Redding that great duet, Tramp. You can Google her. Here's a poem for my granddaughter who has just, just been surprising her, us with all kinds of feats lately. A blur for Zadie. As a toddler, my granddaughter had trouble with balance, wobbled along a ledge while her therapist held her hand. We lost every race we ran with her brother even with the head start he allowed us, trailed him into the building lobby, he and the super high-fiving each other. And now her dad's email says she came first in her high school 400 meter, third in the long jump. I'm showing everyone her video, her long legs a blur as I rewind and point. That's her in the blue, no, the other blue her braid behind like a bird in the current of air, like the arm that once held her steady as she struggled to put one foot in front of the other, that foot now crossing the finish first. So, I'll do the poem for Ukraine. Don't sleep in the subway, darling a 60s song. There is a wall full of posters, some for, some against the war. Yesterday I saw a video in which a woman claimed that Ukraine deserved every blow that left its windows shattered, a small child sweeping glass into a dustpan. Last night I watched tracers follow a jet that dodged until it had no choice but to explode quietly. And as I turned in my own bed, my knee gave such a pop, I cried out, seeing the man at the border being separated from his family, made to return and handed a gun, his relatives huddled in old subway tunnels where the word fight is scribbled under a picture of his president, 
the former comedian, smiling, as if assured of a victory next to the man who masterminded this plan. And just one more. I guess we write poems about our grandchildren. So here's a poem for my grandson, Blue in Prospect Park for Julian. Grandpa wore his t-shirt with the M, having no idea it was Michigan news, though his son went there. When a jogger went by shouting, go blue, he stared at the greenery, the waving leaves until his grandson tugging at his arm said, he means you grandpa, go blue, pointing at the letter. It took a minute for him to make the connection. He'd run about or seen on TV a ritual they had of running naked around the quad on New Year's, cottony puffs of breath in the air about Ann Arbor. He thanked the kid, made himself a promise that the next time, which would come soon enough, on the high line, he would impress a new lady friend. He would respond, yes, go blue, loudly, just to see what she says. Thank you, guys. Oh, everyone, we have we are a fortunate group today to be hearing um, the, the poets that we've been hearing. And oh, my gosh, none other than the, the voice here of Mervyn Taylor reading from not just one, but <laughs> two recent collections. And let me remind you all, because, you know, I want uh, it's, it's so important, the mission of our our group here is to is to support and and get the word out about such fine work and none other than these two collections that you've just heard from from Mervyn in, which is Country of Warm Snow from Shearsman Books and News of the Living just heard from News of the Living Corona Poems Thank you. From Broadstone. I thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Mervyn. It is, it is incredible. And all jiggling aside, no <laughs> worries. No worries. Okay. <laughs> thank we'll you, see you soon. You're very welcome. Thank you. Well, we now will be treated for our closing poet. And I've been, I've been waiting because I have not been able to go yet to any of the launch readings from Susanna H. Case's new collection, The Damage Done from Broadstone Books. So I'm very much looking forward for my first time to be hearing the poems. Um, let me share a little bit with you about our final reader for today. Well, you know her from last week's reading, of course, where uh, we got to hear uh, from her and Margot's astute editorship of the I Want to Be Loved by You poems on Marilyn Monroe. But today, as I mentioned, we are going to be able to hear of the latest of the eight books of poetry from Susanna H. Case. And again, the book today that we will hear from is The Damage Done. Well, other collections, and we've been so fortunate to hear what was like, remains one of my absolute favorite collections when we first started Cultivating Voices. I got to hear Dead Shark on the end train. And there you go, right? The, the love is out there for that collection too. Uh, I, I never ever tire of hearing the poems from Dead Shark either. And that, of course, won a Pinnacle Book Award for Best Poetry Book and a New York City Big Book Award Distinguished Favorite. And it was also a finalist for the Eric Hoffer Book Award. Well, Susanna also is the author of five chapbooks and including 
the Scottish Cafe from Slappering Hall Press. And again, I think I said this last week, if you have not, if you have not, if you have not spent time with the Scottish Cafe, it is an absolute must, must read. It was re-released -re -re in a dual language, English-Polish version. And her poetry, in addition, has been translated into Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese, and has appeared in literary journals vastly, including in Calix, Catamaran, The Cortland Review, Portland Review, Rattle, Rhino, and Upstreet. She's recently retired as a professor from the New York Institute of Technology in New York City, where she taught for 38 years how many students you reached in that time. And they were the most, of course, fortunate to be in your tutelage. And she currently is a co-editor of Slappering Hall Press. And I, I can't say Slappering Hall Press enough today because I want to just encourage you to support this press that has been doing such incredible work for now over 30 years. So thank you, Susanna, for been a remarkable constellation of readings. And thank you, Sandy, and also Kim and Don for this work you do week after week after week. And it's not easy work. I know just getting us all in and everything today was so, uh, you know, and planning everything. It's it's quite an endeavor. And this this and thank you to my previous um, co-readers, Andrea and Margot and Mervyn. This is such a deliciously um, incestuous reading because um, the, the, the way I got to know the people of Slappering Hall Press was uh, when, I won, when I won the competition in 2002. So Andrea and I are press mates at Slappering Hall Press. And then the, um, the, uh, we three editors, Mervyn, Margot, and I, co-editors, are um, not only involved in Slabbering Hall Press, but we're all press mates at Broadstone Books, and we're all actually real life friends, not only um, you know Zoom or, or Facebook friends. We're, we're all in the New York area, and so we, you know, we all see each other. So it's um, yeah, it's 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 great. So I'm reading from the Damage Done, and Sandy said this is the book with book with reflection. And um, this is a book that's um, a departure for me in a sense, because it's, it's much more narrative than my previous work, which is generally narrative, but this is um, way more narrative in that there's, uh, there are recurrent characters throughout the book and a, um, a, a narrative arc, a storyline. The, the book is set in the late 60s, early 70s, and the overall theme is FBI malfeasance during the COINTELPRO program <clears throat> in the US, a program designed to harass and destroy progressive groups and those that supported progressive causes, a program started in the 1950s by J. Edgar Hoover. Um, who we know is not a nice person to put it uh, gently. Uh, the protagonist in the, in the damage done is a model named Janie who has an eating disorder and is involved with a sort of hanger on type figure in the Black Panthers. She's a contributor to, press, to progressive causes and therefore she's a target and she's found dead at the beginning. And so her story is told in flashback generally. So I'm gonna just read one from the beginning where, um, where her body has been found and then skip to the middle of the collection. So this is bystanders. The other cop is guessing suicide. He wants to go home. Pills on the floor of the car and empty containers, Valium, Benzedrine, seltzer water. They'll know after the weekend. Nondescript yellow brick apartment buildings, 
maybe a resident who says, yes, I saw something, or a porter door fastened with a wooden bar overnight. Remember Kitty Genovese murdered in Queens? Nobody admits seeing anything from apartment windows, hundreds of windows, some curtain, some not. The dog walkers hunker down, sullen. Nobody wants to be accused of ignoring a dying woman, not calling the police, letting her be killed right there in the open, if that's what happened, next to the pretty park where the first robin of the season picks its way through ground cover. So this is one of the flashbacks that occur throughout, um, which help develop Janie's character. This is flashback, I just want to make love to you. Because Janie's would-be lover thinks the husband is inattentive, because he wants to tell her whatever she needs to hear, because she's shown up with her checkbook and the organization has unpaid bills, because she's played the seduction game before, just has to ignore her disgust toward her body, because as a case is good background music for getting it on, because she likes the untethered anonymity, thinks this man undressing her with his mind doesn't have a clue about her life, has too much swagger. Because in fact, he's awed, knows damn well, she's semi-famous. Because they both know if you're drinking black coffee, first kisses taste bitter. Because of the weed, he notices the sunset. It's, co it's cottony more of red matches the embroidery on her jeans. Everyone wants answers. He has his friend take a few Polaroids, wants to walk out of the police station looking the same way he looked going in. The one with bad teeth is too nice, surely just a ruse and will damage him the worst, then go to a bar and fill up with booze. Would he like a soda? His throat is dry. He won't give them the satisfaction of needing anything. Let's go over it again, fill in a few holes. He doesn't know a thing. They read him his rights. He's not sure what to say. A freebie legal aid hack won't do him any good. His sadness makes it hard to move. He's losing his fight, Mrs. Janey. This really isn't him anymore. He's barely listening. Political stuff, he has a cop snarl, tries for bravado. Hey, when you're a black man just walking down the street is political stuff. His words fall flat. He isn't cooperative enough, the fat one says, for them to help. Let's go over it again. The fat cop crosses his arms. Ears everywhere. Someone else's nightmare is a stray dog that wanders in and becomes your nightmare. The number of bugging devices in the house, the office, the bar, everywhere. Bugs at Panther headquarters pick up a woman in a sports car. Hey, I love you. Pick up me too as she drives away. Illegal surveillance tapes go missing the way sins are washed off in the river or inconvenient facts. On a hunch, the detective finds a transmitter in his own kitchen phone, the wall phone with a long cord that could stretch into the dining alcove, another in the phone on the bedroom nightstand. When were the feds in the house? Two bugs laid out on the coffee table, the detective staring. He decides to put them back, knows they're there, which evens the score. What this is, he tells his wife, stroking her hair for once, is a lot of trouble. Flashback, dear Janie. You wait for the lightning, you, sorry, you wait for the lighting to be set up. It's quiet, except for seagulls, the crew, you chattering. It's so much colder when your bare feet touch the sand on the Santa Barbara beach. The landscape in the distance is visible, unlike the mountain hollows you know so well. Nothing can hide, not a black sedan, a man motionless and persistently waiting, watching on an ocean road where everyone else is on the move. You gyrate at the water's edge in a striped Kenzo dress, could be selling anything, 
put on your professional smile that says, this is fun. You wish you were having fun somewhere else, Paris, or a place where you could avoid getting wet, a club with a good blues band. That night, you take some pills and fall asleep, dream of someone falling off a mountain, wake up screaming, and the man sits outside your hotel in his shiny sedan, both of you sleepless, waiting. Another flashback, this is flashback clinic. Getting off the Valium, not so bad. Janie thought a few sleepless nights, weak and fuzzy, sweat, some vomiting. She could keep the speed. Can't find the old vials though. Where are they? She might feed solely on love and destruction, a sense of danger. Her pulse feels erratic, as if there's no truth in the beating of her heart. At the clinic appointment, her husband forces her to keep. He points out that her dress is the color of bruises. A terrier dog with a chewed slipper, he won't let go of the idea she's ill. She makes a run for it, pushes open the heavy grayish green doors, quickens her pace past the still life paintings, dozens of vases of flowers. She pants, can't take in enough air, can't stand doctors poking through her business like deranged plumbers. Her husband is right behind, eyes crinkled in fake concern. She knows he would tie her to a cliff face just to try to appease his gods. There's a number of epistolary poems in this collection as well, poems in the form of letters. And this is one of them, and it's called Dear Disorder. Order unravels ugly, like a cheap nylon rope. At first, the feds thought the snitch would be assassinated with the others after spiking the Kool-Aid and aiding that lethal raid. Then they decided to try to keep their investment intact create a patsy focus on bad jacketing, discredit the dead woman's lover. All that was needed, a little cooperation with the change in plans. The feds expected the local cops to fall in line, didn't anticipate any detective would resist. Dear disorder, do you remember when the rumor spread Stokely Carmichael was CIA with a fake document left in a car, a little whisper here and there? That was a piece of cake. The feds wanted to stop the social justice cash flow. And now that Janie's died, they feel at least her money stream has dried. Old stories. The detective has had a Gillette coated stainless steel razor for years. He too is becoming an old story. The slight, blue tinge in the white tile of the bathroom makes him look ill, a reddish yellow cast in the whites of his eyes. Age encircles the periphery like a feral dog or a federal cop looking for weak spots. He has awakened to a horror movie like watching the march of the undead. Lately, he awakens this way every day he's on the job. Today, it's some revolutionary task force sprinkling the city with bombs that plays with his head. He barely has time to think about the little electronic tracker it meets government standard discovered under Janie's Carmen Gia. He has suspicions, but there are no fingerprints. So I'm going to... Um, finish with a poem called Cointel Portrait with Blasts. But first, I'd like to thank all of you who are here and thank again, Sandy and Kim and Don and my co-readers, uh, Margot and Andrea and Mervyn. And uh, so this is Cointel Portrait with Blasts. And I just want to say, um, and this is a book which is heavily footnoted. And, um, I've avoided most of those in the reading today, but uh, I do want to say a little bit about this poem. 
the references are to a, a real explosion that occurred in 1970 at 18 West 11th Street, for those of you who are familiar with the street in New York City. And in the uh, house, a, it's a row house, it was a row house at 18 West 11th, members of the Weather Underground were making the nail bomb that's described in the poem and were also making additional bombs uh, for the library at Columbia University. And three people were killed in the house and several other people were also present but survived and fled. And I know many of you are familiar with the James Merrill poem about the house titled 18 West 11th Street because he also uh, lived in the house as a child. So this is Cohen-Tell Portrait with Blasts. Another young woman, former teacher, hates being rich. The revolution is here. She puts her dividends from the family corporation into the collective's common fund. The Black Panthers laugh at them, summer, summertime soldiers. Townhouse basement on West 11th Street, house where the poet James Merrill was a toddler, house of the parents on vacation in St. Kitts of one of the other bombers. The bomb goes off too soon, meant for that evening, an army base stands for non-commissioned officers and their dates at Fort Dix. They find pieces of bodies shot through with roofing nails, the nails shrapnel to increase the radius of destruction. Air of ash, wood, glass, hail of grit and cracked plaster. In the basement, four 12-inch lead pipes packed with dynamite from the New England Explosives Corporation, blasting caps and cheap alarm clocks, two 50-pound cases of dynamite, enough to destroy every townhouse on the block. A detached fingertip matches that of the former teacher on file from the days of rage. Two male would-be bombers dead too, one crushed. All of this will fail to end the war. About the obliteration, it was nothing egocentric, her father tells the press. Thank you. Everybody, you have just been listening to Susanna H. Case reading from her latest collection, The Damage Done from Broadstone Books. I can't, I can't, I'm really just, I'm so, so haunted by that line, her dress, the color of bruises. Uh, I, I can't get it out of my head. Um, Oh, I just can't get it out of my head. And I was thinking so much too about there's a, there's a there's also like a noir quality, like working wending its way through the collection as well. And even though it's a very, very contemporary, well, relatively contemporary, um experience and the that 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 connection just works so well in drawing us in into the into these into these narrative narrative poems where the images are just so layered and textured and you'll see all the comments in the chat thank you so much, Susanna, for bringing the collection to us today, and for bringing poetry to us as you as you have for the past two years here on Cultivating Voices. I want to be. I want to thank all of our readers today, here on our new books showcase, and remind you that we heard at the top of the hour. Andrea Deacon's award-winning chapbook from Slappering Hall Press, Mother Kingdom. We heard 
from Margot Taft's Stevers collection, The End of Horses. And again, um, the book is dedicated to supporting the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society to conserve and protect the world's oceans and marine wildlife. Well, we heard the, 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 the wild and wondrous poems of Mervyn Taylor from not one, but two of Mervyn's latest, including the full collection, Country of Warm Snow and chapbook, News of the Living Corona Poems. And we closed out again today in this, in this constellation of poetry from Susanna H. Case and her latest collection, The Damage Done. Well, everybody, I am most grateful to have been sitting here atop Portland, Oregon to hear the poetry today. And I wanted to give you a little bonus poem today only because it's a special, special Sunday. And the second I tell you why, you'll understand. Well, my friends, I have a penchant for the disaster, a little penchant for the disaster. And today is April 10th, it's April 10th, 2022. But on April 10th, 19. 12, 110 years ago, on this day, a favorite ship of mine, the Titanic, set sail on her maiden voyage at high noon out of Southampton, England's birth. I've actually been there on the 100th anniversary at the birth where she set sail from. And I thought on the occasion of the 110th anniversary, I'd share a, po a poem that celebrated that day, April 10th. And we know, we all know what would happen four days later, but on April 10th, 1912, here's a little reminiscence of what you might have experienced had you been in Southampton, England, 110 years ago. This is called Sailing Day, Southampton. April 10th, 1912. Most of the city makes its way to the quay to help launch Southampton into nautical history. Everyone knows a crew member on board. As departure time inches closer, families dressed in their Sunday finest run willy-nilly through the streets. Fathers hoist their cargo up onto their shoulders. Mothers tug at their little ones' sleeves. Everyone wants to be able to declare, I was there when the Titanic breaks free from White Star Dock, births 44 and 43 at 12 o'clock. On board, the crew and provisions are ready. Sweetbreads, sausages, fish and meats, fresh cream, fresh milk, eggs and butter, 2,000 pounds of coffee, hundreds of barrels of flour, thousands of quarts of ice cream, 8,000 cigars. Little bonus today on April 10th, 2022. Again, gratitude to our four readers today. Andrea, Margo, Mervyn, and Susanna, thank you so much for sharing your illustrious poetry with us. And I want to remind you all to join us next week as we continue through Poetry Month here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And our format next week 
you all are the features. Come join us for our poet's focus on the theme of emergence. It's Easter Sunday. Come share a poem, emerge with us through the month of April. It'll be great to hear your voice here on the program. And again, uh, it's always a pleasure to host the program with you every single week. And a reminder that we really come together every week to celebrate this art of poetry, the diverse voices that we are fortunate enough to be able to share and um, learn from. And I wanna thank our audience today. We have folks in the room with us from Canada, New Zealand, Ireland, the United States. I'm probably missing a few other places. Um, so grateful you could all join us. And I do, do hope you will come back next week and share your poetry with us. I always like to close out the program to remind you all that our humanity really does depend on our deepest of listening. And that has remained true throughout the pandemic. And as we have gone through so much worldwide to hold up and, and continue to reflect upon, poetry is the great medium for that. So not only should, do I urge you to keep listening to poetry, but I urge you, of course, all, stay safe within your being, take very, very good care of your beloveds, and keep writing those miraculous poems that you always bring to our stage here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Well, that's it for me today, folks. This is Sandy Yanone saying thank you so much for being with me and our great guests. Thank you, one and all. And I urge you all to have a very, very good week. And we'll see you next time. Can we unmute and clap, Sandy? Let's do it. Round of applause. Bravo, bravo. Wonderful.